there's not a whole lot I can say to introduce the two attorney generals sitting at the table and chairs in front of me, but I think it's a, a real honor and a pleasure to have, um, and I'm, I'm gonna refrain from saying new attorney general anymore because he is the attorney general, Mr. Phil Weiser. So what little time we've got to spend together, I can assure you the San Luis Valley and really rural Colorado has an advocate in, in Phil Weiser and a, and a special appreciation for water and the challenges we have here. So uh, he and uh, former, uh, well, you're a former a lot of stuff, former attorney general, <laughs> former senator, former secretary of the interior. I hope you find something you're really good at sometime, Ken. I'm still looking. Still looking. Ken Salazar, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Cleve. Uh, first, uh, let me say to uh, President uh, Cheryl Lovells and to uh, Cleve uh, Simpson and to all of you, thank you so much for sponsoring this, for uh, putting the spotlight on the importance of this valley, on Adams State University, on the Salazar Center, uh, and on the substance of uh, what we are talking about here. And it's really not just about water, it really is about uh, the past and most importantly, the, the promise and future of, of the San Luis Valley. And secondly, uh, just uh, to say uh, a word about my great friend, Phil Weiser, and you will hear a lot more from him, but uh, we're truly honored here to have Phil here in the Valley so early on in his administration. Um, I remember back in the 80s when I was working with uh, Roy Romer as his chief counsel, and we came here to Adams State because we had convinced him that it was important to put the spotlight on rural Colorado. Most of you know that the Golden Curtain Falls somewhere south of Colorado Springs or maybe south of Pueblo. And yet the reality of it is that uh, the people in places like the Valley have very significant opportunities and challenges from healthcare to law enforcement to water issues to jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And so we brought Roy Romer here back in June of 1987. And one of the things that uh, Phil and I talked a lot about uh, during the course of his two-year campaign uh, seeking the Attorney General's office was about the importance of rural Colorado. And so today, his visit here, his uh, tour of uh, a part of Guanajuato County this afternoon is all part of a fulfillment of a promise of someone who said that he wanted to be the Attorney General for all of the people of Colorado, uh, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Greens, whomever. And uh, so today, uh, you have the real deal here in Phil Weiser. Let's give him another round of applause. Now, some people ask me why I wear a hat. You know, it's pretty obvious. You know, it's cold in the valley. You know, hot, hot in the summer sun, you gotta protect it. But a lot of, uh, when I first started working on these water issues, uh, I'm sure that I had a uh, full head of hair when I was uh, an intern working with uh, David Robbins and with Mary Malarkey in the Colorado Attorney General's office after my first year of law school and we were working on the Houston cases. And so uh, I've lived the life of water here in Colorado and a lot of different manifestations and I thought I would touch on a few of those before we had Phil talk about his perspectives on uh, water here in the valley. Uh, my view of the valley, given my so 55, 60 year history of having in, been involved in just about every single water issue down here, is that we've been through a lot of tremendous pain and a huge amount of uh, expenditure on litigation and on investments in terms of protecting the uh, waters of this valley and creating sustainability for agriculture and for our communities. And we're not there yet. Uh, there are huge challenges still ahead of us threats that we face from people who want to export water from the San Luis Valley up to Douglas County in Denver, which really hasn't changed that much, or other kinds of threats to the water supply that we have here in the valley. But notwithstanding those threats and the pains of the past, uh, we are in a good place because the people of this valley have come together as a result of much of the acrimony of the last 40, 50 years to try to solve problems uh, that nobody else is able to solve anywhere, not only in the state of Colorado, but really around the world. And uh, here at this uh, hallowed place of learning, Dr. Levels, I think we have an opportunity with you and uh, the Rio Grande Water Conservation District and the other water entities to really develop a uh, water resource center that can teach the world uh, how you can solve some of the most complicated problems in water. If you think about seven billion people on our earth today, 
uh, the importance of water is only going to increase and how we manage our water, uh, how we protect our water is, all something, is something that every community, every region, every water basin is, is going to struggle with. So thank you for leading this here at Adams State and here in the Assemblies Valley. So just a couple of quick points. Uh, you know, David Robbins gave an overview of some of the history in one of our water roundtables yesterday, and I won't repeat all of what he said, but I'll say it more, I think, from uh, the point of view of, of my own eyes. Uh, you know, we all know about the 1938 compact. I was uh, chairman of the Rio Grande uh, Commission, uh, the federal representative on there for four or five years. So I've learned a lot about the compacts and, and the three states. But really, it was not something which was talked much about in terms of its impact here in the San Luis Valley until the U.S. Supreme Court said the law is a law and you've got to abide by it. In Colorado, you've been taking a lot more water than your share, and therefore you have to start delivering more water into New Mexico and into Texas and to comply with the requirements of the treaty between the United States and Mexico. And that all happened in the 60s. So how did it affect my family? And there are members of my family here who, my brother Leroy, who everybody knows, and my brother jo Elliot and John and Gustavon and my sister-in-law Loretta all here in the audience. And they'll remember some of these things, but it was the 60s and uh, we used to have uh, two ditches on our ranch irrigating out of the San Antonio River, a tributary of the Coneros. One of them was an older right, uh, 1857 appropriation date, that basically gave us good water and we raised some of the best alfalfa, and that was how our family uh, in that place made a, a living. We had another ditch called the Eight Mile Ditch, which had a water right in the 1880s and had a much larger amount of water, but it was a very uh, low priority. And so, as Craig's depictions of the priority system show, if you have a lower priority, you don't get much water. But we had enough water in there uh, before the compact was being enforced to basically be able to grow water in that place, so, or, or well, alfalfa on, that, on those 17 acres. Well, compact was enforced, we had to start delivering water, filled downstream, and uh, all of a sudden it started drying up and eventually it all turned into, into uh, brush and we were not able to produce any alfalfa from that field. So you can imagine how from the point of view of, of farmers, and we, we were poor farmers, we didn't understand really a lot of what was going on, and we felt like our water was being stolen from us because for hundreds of years we had used these ditches and these water rights. All of a sudden we couldn't do it anymore because a big badass state through its regulations was telling us that we couldn't do it anymore. And uh, it affected us, it affected, affected our economic way of life, and it affected a lot of people in the San Luis Valley. Well, it was shortly after that, not too long after the Supreme Court case, that. Uh, you get into the uh, integration uh, management legal framework that was created in the uh, 1965 and 1969 Colorado uh, Water Acts, where basically there was a recognition that really there's no difference between surface water that's up here and groundwater that is down here because it's all integrated. If you uh, put a well into the aquifer, you basically are just taking water from the stream system, so that integration needed to happen, but the technology of wells and, and pumping had moved fast forward in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and so you saw the entire agricultural economy uh, being built up here in the valley and the Arkansas River Basin and other places around the state based on the, on the well economy, but the truth is that those water rights are very junior. You start talking 1950s, 60s, 70s, they have no comparison in terms of the seniority of a right from uh, 1855, 1857, 1860. And so that said uh, about, essentially, I think, the dynamics of, that have created uh, the great conflicts uh, which now are finally, after some 50 years or 40 years from the 1970s, doing what Craig and what now be, you know, before the water court, the, the rules that are being promulgated to try to deal with what will be an integration of those systems so that you're protecting the surface water rights, same time allowing the economy to move forward with uh, the reliance on groundwater, but at the same time, based on what the law requirement is, having the, the water uh, supply and, and, and the sustainability of, of the aquifer uh, something that, that can in fact be achieved. So much progress that is, that is being made on, on that front. Um, so. So the, the, the integration, so the compact requirements, uh, the integration between surface and groundwater issues, those are all real important issues. 
And I would put a, a third basket. Uh, and this is uh, a basket which is really here and near today uh, for all of us. And that's what's happening with respect to the interest of outsiders who want to come into this valley and who want to buy up the land and water in this valley, buy and dry, if you will, uh, large tracts of land, put that water into pipelines, take it over Poncha Pass, and fill the very unmet needs of Douglas County, Aurora, many other communities up in, in the Denver metropolitan area. Well, you, many of you, have been in those fights, as have I. So the fight against the San Marco pipeline, the fight against AWDI, the fight against the son of AWDI, the, the political fights against referendum A. And frankly, we beat them every single time. And I can tell you, I hear, because I know that there are people knocking on these doors and putting on the doors of the Rio Grande Water Conservation District, that they're back. They're back here because they want more water from the valley because they see a significant economic return for their economic ventures in the same, in the same way that Maurice Strong and others who were involved in, the, in those prior projects uh, uh, are, are coming here looking at the, at, at the value of this resource. I remember having these conversations with a guy by the name of Governor Dick Lamb because he was on the board of AWDI at the time and he said, well, Look at all the water you have in the valley. You don't need it. You can share it. They say you have as much water in the San Luis Valley, I think, on an annual basis as what is produced because of our great alluvium, which is so deep. As much water in that San Luis Valley as flows, I think, annually in the Colorado River. So why isn't there enough water there for, for Douglas County and for some of these other places that are growing? Anyway, uh, I wrote him about a six-page letter telling him why he was wrong. And I think what I said 30 years ago is probably exactly the same thing I would tell him today. So you can count me as a citizen. I have no title. I have lots of former titles. But you can count me in as a citizen that will take the position that water will flow out of this valley to the north uh, only over my dead body. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Not, not under my body. No. But that said, uh, it, it doesn't, you know, there's another role that the Attorney General has, right, and it's uh, you know, living by the rule of law, and, and there's a reality here in uh, our water rights system that, in fact, it could happen. And so uh, the wearing of us, and how we are aware of what's happening is one of those things. So I would say one of the, one of the in this third bucket, one of the threats and concerns that we really need to be concerned about it's what's happening with those other interests that are looking here at the valley as a, as a great source of water and just making sure that in this very water short valley, uh, we're able to protect uh, the water that is here. The final point I want to make, um, I could use probably 10, 15 examples, but I, I only want to use one, uh, about how this valley has come together in what is extraordinary collaboration to create some wonderful things. Yeah, for decades, I've worked with many of you on economic development here in the valley. But I think one of the very smartest things that this valley ever did was when we came together, about 100% of us, and we said, we're going to create the Great Sand Dunes National Park together. I was there with some of you. I think Travis was there, and I'm uh, sure David was there, and others in uh, 1999 with uh, Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell, Congressman Scott McGinnis, and the Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt, uh, along with me, had some tough issues we were working on in Colorado. Uh, one of them was the Animus La Plata project. The other one was this conversation that we had started going with uh, people like David Harrison and the Nature Conservancy and others about whether we could provide some additional protection to the water in the San Luis Valley through uh, the creation of a national park. I remember 300 people at the sand dunes that morning when we had a ceremony and Senator Campbell saying, it's possible we might be able to do it. But it, t it took 10 or 12 years, he said, to get the Black Canyon of the Gunnison done. And so we expect that the same thing is going to happen here, that it's going to take a long time. Well, not for the people of this valley, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, United, and saying, no, if there's a way we can further protect our water by essentially having a protection of the in-situ water that keeps the sand dunes there and the water flowing in the way that it does around the sand dunes, if we can do that and it protects our water, we ought to go ahead and do it. 
Within a year, President Bill Clinton had signed the law that created the Great Sand Dunes National Park. And it was the environmental community, Nature Conservancy, other organizations. It was the ranchers and the farmers of the San Luis Valley. It was a business community. It was a statement of great unity in how we achieved a series of goals. Number one, we were protecting the water of the valley. And I dare say, they dare say today that of all the basins of the valley, we probably have the best uh, protection, interbasin transfer protection here in the valley than in any other basin. And, and the sand dunes is part of that. There's some other uh, legal uh, provisions that have been enacted as well. Uh, but secondly, uh, what it also did is it created a great economic value here for the San Luis Valley. You know, I said last night, I remember back when we were talking about the National Park, there are about 180,000 visitors coming to visit the sand dunes as a national monument. You know, Cleve wasn't born there when I was a kid, but I remember we'd go to the sand dunes as part of our spring, you know, we'd get the half day off for school or whatever, so we'd go to the sand dunes, but it was a monument. We had 180,000 people. Last year, I was told that we reached 480,000 visitors into the great sand dunes, 180 to 480,000. Now, think about, I, my understanding is we're going to be way over half a million. So think about how that tourism economy is helping us here in the valley. Think about the jobs that it's crea creating. There's some opportunities actually to do some things even to further enhance those economic development opportunities for the valley. So the valley in looking for economic diversification I think was able to achieve that in the creation of the Great Sand Dunes National Park. So let me with that just say uh, this as I turn it over to Phil for, uh, for his comments and then we would love to have an opportunity to have a dialogue and, and questions with all of you. Um, you know, some people say that the only positions in government are, uh, that are important are being the governor of the state or being uh, president of the United States. I think that's all BS. No, it is true, those are important positions. But I'll tell you an important position, and that's uh, being the Attorney General of Colorado. I, I, it was a job I loved, I had it for six years. But you get to have the opportunity to really be the protector of the people. So even against governors that want to do excesses, I, di I didn't mind suing Bill Owens when I knew he was wrong, and I did. Okay? And uh, there is something about being the people's lawyer, which uh, the Attorney General has in his, in, his, in, in, his, in his responsibility. My view, at least he'll be Attorney General for the next four years. Uh, Phil will be Attorney General potentially for the next, uh, for the next eight years here in Colorado. And having him here with all of you, learning as he was doing from Cleve and Craig Cotton and so many others, is an, an incredible opportunity for us in the Valley, incredible opportunity for him as well, just to learn about the reality of the issues that we face. And so with that, join me in one more time giving uh, one of our statewide elected officials, the best statewide elected official, Phil Weiser, a round of applause. So Ken Salazar and I grew up a little differently. He, in this wonderful part of the world, I, um, on the East Coast after my family, came here as refugees. So Ken has seven generations of Salazars in the San Luis Valley. Uh, I'm the first person born as a US citizen in my family after, uh, thanks. after my family uh, survived uh, the Holocaust and came to this country for a new life. What I want to start with, um, a great Yiddish tradition, which is let me say a few words before I speak. <laughs> <laughs> the first point is the mentorship here. Now I've received that personally from Ken. And think about this, he's here because he cares, and he has shown me how much he cares about mentoring and supporting a next generation of leadership. And he said, Phil, bring your leadership team here. I will help mentor them in what is the heart and soul of Colorado. And we are benefiting from that mentorship. And Dave Robbins, who's here this morning, because as Destiny has it, uh, his flight was canceled, so we get to have Dave Robbins here. <laughs> 
And Dave's been an unbelievable mentor. And then others like Cleve and Travis and Carla, uh, that's the spirit of this valley. And that's the spirit of Colorado. But more than that, when you think about what is happening in water, I'm a student of public policy, law, and problem solving. There is nothing like what we're seeing in water. You can't take for granted the creation of these sub-districts and the work that they do together. Compare any area of policy and show me something working as effectively as water. And then here's the other thing. The collaboration and innovative problem solving in water is being done better in the San Luis Valley probably than anywhere in the world. So give yourselves a round of applause. Which is why Adam State and uh, Cheryl and Rio have such important work to do. This needs to be a convener to talk about what it is to have institutional innovation and new technologies to manage this scarce resource. We heard about it from Craig. We have a changing climate which is making this issue harder everywhere. We can lead that here in Colorado. This can be part of your economic engine as we develop these new approaches and then bring them elsewhere. I'm excited to help support that partnership. Thank you. <laughs> Aaron, was that your daughter there? No, yours, all right, it's great, uh, thank you. The points I'll make is this spirit isn't limited to water. It's about outdoor recreation as a vibrant industry, Ken mentioned tourism. I also wanna see that as an alternative to incarceration as we improve criminal justice. I wanna see us take on the opioid epidemic. All of that can be led here, and that's why this is such an important area for me to partner with. We need to keep this collaboration going. Please uh, reach out to me and my office. We have important work to do together. So as for a few of my main remarks, and I wanna to get to the conversation, I have to say, this is the natural beauty, and, and man, Rio's slideshow is extraordinary. That's actually not the most impressive part of the valley. It's the people here. Aaron was telling me just how he ended up here through uh, fate, where people take people in. I know, I've heard stories, people come to Adam State and their just mind is blown of what an incredible community. People on my team who've gone to Adam State and their lives have been shaped. This institution plays such an important role. What I wanna talk a little bit about is a little of this history on water, what we learn from it and where we go from here. Um, first, I want to acknowledge my deputy, Natural Resources, a position once filled by Dave Robbins. Amy Beatty, where's Amy? When I was looking for someone to lead this effort, and we had uh, great people on our transition team, including uh, the great Rio de la Vista I mentioned earlier, uh, I needed someone who cared about water and cared about the valley. Amy with a credible history uh, in this area, including in the Colorado Water Trust, uh, met that bill. And she has been teaching me a lot about the Rio Grande and about how it really makes this valley. And, and you got a great tutorial from Craig about some of that background. What I've learned as I visited here is we have to take care of this place. The threats that Ken mentioned, the past history, we have to remember what Faulkner said which is the past is not dead, it's not even the past. We have quite a story, and Dave Robbins was telling it again yesterday, there used to be a lot of acrimony and fighting between farmers and ranchers. Amazingly, the community came together, and Ken was a big part of that leadership. That togetherness has to be the true north, protecting this valley. If we can do that, we're good. There's nothing that this valley can't meet together as a challenge. And let me just share that that hasn't been true in all parts of our state. This is an important convening because it brings together with the center so many community leaders. I've mentioned Cleve, uh, Heather Dutton's doing great work on the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Uh, you heard from Craig. Uh, there is incredible talent, working together, we are going to be able to get great things done. Let me mention a few things about how we learn from the past and go forward. First, 
Ken mentioned by and dry. If people here haven't heard the story of into Crowley County, you haven't seen the damage that happens when short-sighted decisions lead to long-term consequences. The number one industry in Cow Crowley County, prisons. That can't happen to this valley. Here's how one article talked about it. Crowley County is a case study in what happens when the water runs out, when the fields go barren, when hope dries up. The place is whatever you want to make of it. For some, it's an environmental disaster worthy of academic papers. For others, it's a crucible in which you can assess the psychological impact of what happens when good people make short-sighted decisions. For me, Crowley County, and I was there twice during my campaign, reminds us how not to manage water. John Stolp took me there. You go over the border to Prowers County and you get great watermelons or cantaloupe, but not in Crowley County. We developed a water plan to guide us going forward and our governor's executive order stated this point plainly. Coloradans find that the current rate of purchase and transfer of water rights from irrigated agriculture, also known as buy and dry, is unacceptable. We have witnessed the economic and environmental impacts on rural communities when water is sold and removed from an agricultural area that depends on agriculture for its economic activity. The ability to learn from mistakes is one of our nation's and our state's best qualities. In the case of water law and policy, we've learned that buy and dry, rather than collaborative problem solving, is no way to go. We need to work together, all parts of our state, to address this challenge that we have on account of a changing climate. We have less water because there's less natural snowpack, and there are more people. That calls for us to meet those challenges. We have to find ways to respect our water rights and, and avoid future Crowley counties. It's not the coward way. We must keep to our true north of collaboration and problem solving together. As we go forward, we are going to address our water management challenges with leadership and support from our office by encouraging innovative solutions. There are a number of them. We had a great conversation with Cleve and others. We want to work with you to figure out what those are. It includes how do we support healthy, source, healthy forests, watersheds, and soils? How do we conserve water in creative ways? How do we restore rivers and streams? How do we update water infrastructure, and how do we implement reuse and smart storage solutions? We can do this in Colorado. Let me say a few words about how. First, leadership. The mentorship and leadership in this room, again, this doesn't happen by accident. This spirit, this commitment to spending time together, as Travis said, building trust, working together, this is extraordinary and it will have huge impacts, not just for water, but for broader building an economy here that is sustainable and vibrant for years to come. I can mention a few of the efforts. We talked about the sub-district, the Rio Grande Headwaters Restoration Project, the Colorado Rio Grande Restoration Foundation, the Conservancy District. You can go on. These aren't accidents. These are extraordinary developments, and Adam State has been core in its curriculum and leadership. You all need to recognize You've built a platform that you can work on for years to come. Number two, the community spirit here, again, this is something that do not take for granted. We have to have this mindset, we are in this together. David Robbins reminded me of the origin of the statement, we either hang together or we hang separately. That's what Ken was getting at. We've got to keep that together looking ways to sustain the water, the economy, and the natural systems that sustain them. And third, and this is a Colorado value that all of us need to appreciate our pioneering spirit, a commitment to innovation. We're not gonna solve this challenge by looking to 
What have we done before? Creating sub-districts and making them work was a tr tremendous response to what the water engineer said. And again, Craig put it up there. Look at the aquifers. And I, I think it was really powerful that Amber said, I didn't know what an aquifer was. I just took it for granted. Well, the people who are working in these sub-districts, they don't take this for granted. They recognize it's an existential challenge and they are bringing innovative solutions. We will work with you every step of the way to help you develop them. I also need to say this is something that Ken embodies so well. It, it's clear from the history. We need to be optimistic. We can do this together. And that's a spirit that will serve you all very well, as will listening. I'm involved in lots of public policy discussions where building trust and listening is not necessarily the foundational platform. Those discussions are a lot less pleasant and they often become very uh, pointing fingers, people casting blame. It, it doesn't go well. As opposed to listening hard, and Roy Romer often talked about this, all truth is partial, by which Roy Romer meant you don't see all the truth, but if you listen to people and you work hard to integrate, you can find solutions that can work for everyone. That's what we need to do here in the San Luis Valley and in Colorado. Let me say a few words about the sorts of challenges that Ken and others talked about. First, you heard about this from Craig, the uh, issues around compliance with the compact were at some point uh, a little tricky, but with help from Mother Nature, I love that slide, Craig, sort of the, I don't know how Craig put it, it was a really good day when you got to work through, but it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to be working hard to stay in compliance, and we've seen that, and we will work with you to continue doing that, avoiding the sorts of disputes. In fact, now the issues of the Rio Grande, we're actually a bystander because New Mexico and Texas have some issues, and we're the ones trying to mediate and work through them with really tremendous leaders and lawyers in our office. The other thing that we have to think about is how we come up with new sorts of solutions, like the ones I mentioned. That's something we'll keep working on at the local level with the legislature. This process has taken a little while, and I do think we're headed in a very promising direction. But the threat is there. The shortcut, the short side decision. Well, isn't it easy? You've got all that water. Can't that just solve the problem? Again, three lenses, the legal, economic and ecological all provide strong grounds for skepticism. Let me say a word about each. First, because of leadership, most notably Ken Salazar, Dave Robbins, others, there is a legal regime restricting out-of-basin transfers here in the San Luis Valley. That didn't happen by accident, and one of the things was Tim Worth, when was, sen was senator, passed a law that said if you're going to actually try to do anything like that, the Colorado Water Conservation Board and the Federal Department of Interior have to conduct analysis on the impact of any export project on the local treasures, like the Sand Dunes National Park, in order for the federal approval process to happen. That's an incredibly important tool that we'll be working with. And there's statewide requirements that happen too to make sure that issues around revegetation, compensating the community, and any pollution issues are addressed, not to mention the local rules, including those on groundwater management and the water court process. Those legal tools are there to protect you and your community. Working together, it's important that they be used. Number two, the economic impact. There is going to be a short-term buck to be made by some people. We saw it in Crowley County. What economists will teach is there's a concept of positive externalities. When a community's agricultural production is vibrant, lots of people are benefiting because they're working around that industry. One argument you might hear is, oh yes, the San Luis Valley exports water. When they sell potatoes, they're exporting water. 
But the problem with that is the potato economic ecosystem is robust and has many positive externalities. Once you just sell the water, you've sold your future. What's important is to keep that community mindset in mind and that any initial action sets a precedent. And be careful that you don't have a precedent that doesn't have a limiting principle because you can quickly see a trickle move to a stream. As for the ecological impacts, Ken talked about it. The surface water, the confined, the unconfined aquifers, they are not existing in hermetically sealed boundaries. They are interdependent. It's important to have careful scientific and engineering judgments. As any project were to go forward, be mindful of longer term ecological consequences as well as the economic and community impacts. In short, there's a right way to handle water in Colorado and there's a wrong way. In communities like the Valley, it's important that the legal tools be used appropriately to protect those communities and their local economies. And we at the Attorney General's office are going to work hard to manage water the right way and protect the Valley. As you evaluate proposed projects that are not designed to protect your community, know that we will be with you to protect your ecological and economic future. <laughs> On a closing note, let me share how deeply moved and impressed I am with this valley. My commitment is I will continue to work with you and not just on water, but on how we address the opioid epidemic, build a broader base of economic opportunity here, and make sure that here we solve problems the Colorado way to show our nation what democracy can look like when people work and come together. Thank you for your leadership. We welcome people's thoughts, ideas, and questions. We can see you now. I want to hear what you think about the idea that this is not a drought. Or do you think it's a drought? Or is it something different? I, I heard the word on NPR, and I would like to hear it more, said more often, a ratification. So let me see if I'm catching Julie's drift. <laughs> a drought has a connotation that it will pass. The need the mandate to lower the amount of water that's being used, something managed by the subdistricts, it's not a temporary situation, at least as we can tell. It's our new normal. This is an important point because we have enough reason to know that we can't stick our head in the sand and say, oh, don't worry, this is going to get better. The amount of scientific guidance and data guiding these policies is clear. What is important is this community is not putting its head in the sand. This community is working hard to develop those solutions and that is how you will come to terms. And there's a lot of interesting conversations, including do we need to think about some different crops with water in mind? If you were to shift from alfalfa to uh, quinoa, I heard yesterday, as well as hemp. You can maintain agricultural productivity using less water. That's a decision that is being foisted upon us, and those are conversations that I know can be led here at Adam State. I would add, uh, Julie, I think maybe I take your question on uh, relative to the, the broader global issue that I think is being debated on climate and climate change and but all that means, it's real, and the, I think 99.9% .9 of all scientists that look at it say that it's real. And one of the conversations Bill and I have talked about, I've talked about it with lots of other people, is sometimes the best way to see climate change is through the lens of water. And if you look at the uh, models that have been uh, created to project what's going to happen with water in the Rio Grande Basin and in the Colorado River Basin, which are two of the essential rivers of our, of our nation and, and our state, 
those are the two basins that are going to see the most precipitous declines in water than what we currently have. And so the way that I see those kinds of issues, at the end of the day, we as a humanity are going to be able to survive, but it comes down to how we manage our water resources. So if you think about compact compliance, it's about how we manage our water resources. If you think about the integration of uh, surface water rights and groundwater rights and the formation of subdistricts, alternative crops, that's how we manage our water. If you look on down the road 10, 20, 30 years, and even assuming that uh, you know, our scientists, Bureau of Reclamation, others are right, and you see a further decline in the amount of water they actually will get, then the answer there too is going to be found in the management scenarios that you all are working on here in the Valley already. So one point on Craig's discussion, it's not just, I know it's, I'll use the word because people use it, the drought, which again, new normal, but the, the wildfires that are happening. Have anyone here other than Ken been to up top Colorado? That's what I thought. The fires that happened in Werfenel County, they had firefighters come in from across the US and they said, can we save up top? And they did just barely. The collaboration the firefighters felt from that community, a lot of firefighters came from all over the US, they said they'd never seen that before. We are not only in a world where we have to do what we can to address climate change, we have to manage the fact that we are gonna see more severe weather, fires, this is going to take more innovation and ad adaptation. Travis. Sorry, you can go first, then Travis second. Okay. Or, you, who do you want to go first? Go okay. Uh, yeah, for Ken and the Attorney General, uh, there's a kind of a Gordian knot that's been tightening in my head for the last 20 years. And it has to do with you know, in the valley we speak of it being our water. But actually, the state owns the water. And we have possessory and, and control uh, uses of the water. And the Colorado Constitution provides that no citizen will ever be deprived of domestic water. So at what point is that constitutional requirement going to come into real severe conflict with these alternate uses? because ultimately the number one beneficial use is domestic water. And if Douglas County reaches a point where they can demonstrate that they need this water, they can come take it, I, as I understand it. You know, in, in spite of legislation that has been uh, pointed at some of the particulars. Now the other- Are you a lawyer, by the way? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> but I have farmed for 42 years and I can tell you that I have been using very, very expensive water to grow very, very cheap crops. Those crops have never paid for the total externalized costs to the soil, to the environment, etc. So that's the knot. You know, at what point does this really become a point of, of ungovernable tension between the interests of agriculture who it, that you know, likes to use the water but really isn't being paid for what they produce unless we start growing some crops that have real economic value, uh, like cannabis, for example. That becomes, you know, well, that's, that's a way for a farmer to actually be paid enough to receive enough profit to pay the externalized costs of operating a farming or ranching operation. Let me take the very easy part of your question, and I'll let Ken handle the rest. <laughs> I'm all in for how do we help farmers find a way towards, you mentioned cannabis, I mentioned hemp, that can give sustainable, vibrant agricultural opportunity, which is also more sound from a water management perspective. As for the rest of you or not, I'll let our expert weigh in. <laughs> Well, let me just say, the, the reality of it is, the answers all come back to water management, right? Because it is close to 90% of our, of our water across the West is, uh, is used for agricultural purposes. And so only a small percent actually is used for domestic, industrial, and, and other, kinds of, other, other kinds of purposes. 
So I don't really see the ultimate uh, debate coming down to this question of giving a domestic precedence over, over agriculture. I think what you're going to have is you're going to have water management that uh, is going to address the ecological, the recreational, the irrigation consumptive uses and, and other values. And in those values, whatever is ultimately used for domestic purposes, you know, the, the water lawyers in the audience will know if you're doing a, a calculation of how much water you're actually using with the water that's flowing in your, in your house, it's very little, right? Because most of it flows through your showers and your toilets and your dishwashers and back out. And so very little of it is consumptively used. Very different if you're using alfalfa, right? 38 inches, I think Leroy was telling us. You know, very different if you're using uh, a barley or you're using hemp or so something else. So I, I, don't, I don't see that as uh, ultimately being the issue. I very much agree with what uh, Phil has said and we've heard from people uh, yesterday and today as well that uh, the ag value added products is something that this uh, university through Cheryl and others, uh, uh, I think there's some opportunities there and I think uh, they're being explored obviously with hemp but I think there's other areas as well that, uh, uh, that can, can be explored. Let me make one other point, which is important from the domestic, call it front range perspective. One of the big mistakes that can be made on any number of levels, political, economic, cultural, or spiritual, is to say in narrow economic terms, oh look, this isn't worth that much producing this food vis-a-vis -vis the water, let's just ship it all to the front range. What that misses is the following. We are all one Colorado. To have a great Colorado, we need a great San Luis Valley. And number two, the people on the front range, they want to buy food that is grown in Colorado. And so all of us together having a shared interest in our future is how we will avoid what is a theoretical property rights debate. The goal of water policy is that we never essentially sit on and litigate based on our rights. If we are in that fight, we've already lost. Ken was telling me how much money this valley has spent on litigation. The goal is through collaboration, innovative problem solving to not end up in such legal battles. acre feet, which is, Craig said, the river does 600 and some thousand acre feet a year. There, I don't see a reason why the consumptive use of water that goes out in a potato can't be sold out to a domestic user if, if, the, if, the, if the demands of the Constitution that every citizen has the right to that water becomes necessary. Well, let me just give you, give you my quick response on that. I, I've watched this movie before in the Owens Valley in California. I watched this movie before with AWDI. I watched it in spades as I saw Colorado Springs and Aurora dry up the Arkansas River Basin. And it's not going to happen in the valley. And that's been our agenda for 30 years. And so, and I, don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but there is a, there, there is a, 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 a reality that when you take the water that is being used in a place like the San Luis Valley, you open up a spigot of 22,000 acre feet as chapter one, I can bet you that within 20 years that spigot has been opened up to 222,000 acre feet, and then you all of a sudden have an Owens Valley kind of created valley, which is not what my ancestors came here for. Uh, thank you for being here today. Phil, you mentioned uh, forest health. And uh, could you comment on what you think the state's role should be or could be in moving forward in assisting the federal agencies and dealing with the forest health uh, challenge that we have? My comment is I wish Dan Gibbs was here to answer the question. <laughs> um, Dan, as you may know, is the head of DNR. Uh, we hit the jackpot. He has lived his life focused on these natural resources issues. The perspective I would offer is that 
We live in an ecosystem, so our forests, our rivers, our wells, they, they have interconnections. Again, and, and if we start thinking we can uh, rob Peter to pay Paul, um, we're kidding ourselves. Now, I am not a scientist, and I'm not even a real natural resources lawyer, so um, uh, what I can just say is we need to bring people together to work on these issues, and we need to see the big picture, and, and that has, I think, been the history here, and it's where the work is going, and as you have ideas or thoughts on it, uh, Amy can go a lot deeper on these issues than I can. I can simply say I'm, I'm with you to keep working on them in years ahead. We got five minutes left, so uh, Rio, if there's anyone you want to make sure we hear from, let us know. Uh, I likewise thank you for both for coming. Uh, we've all heard the saying that water flows uphill towards money. My understanding of water in the San Luis Valley and throughout Colorado is that it, it's not necessarily a state-owned, but rather an individually owned property right. Okay, so would you mind expanding or expounding a little bit on any legislative firewalls against the trans basin transfers and what we can do as a community to kind of counter that individually owned property right with it buy and dry. I take that as a water lawyer. Amen. So, you know, for my first seven years of my life as a, uh, as in, uh, Did besides you say ranch, 70? First seven years, not 70. Seven, first seven years. Seven. I, I practiced uh, water law, so I know a little bit about it. And, I've kicked up to the Supreme Court with David Robbins a couple of times and a few other things. So here's the reality. Our water right in Colorado is separate from our land. So land is your private, private property, a water right is private property. And as the owner of a private right, unless you put it under a conservation easement or something, you can separate it from the land. And usually the, the legal doctrine is, is you, so, you, can, you, you quantify how much you can separate based on the consumptive use of the water right on your land, and, and, and that is your right. So uh, that, in fact, uh, can happen, and in fact, uh, this renewable water resource or whatever the group is that's trying to take the, the 22,000 acre feet is using that concept. Question is, how does that apply to the, to the protections that have been put here in, into the San Luis Valley? As uh, Phil mentioned, uh, you know, I testified as a director of the Department of Natural Resources in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee in front of then Senator Tim Worth for the, uh, what was called, I think, the San Luis Valley Water Protection Act. And there was a recognition there that uh, the federal government, because of the interest here in the valley, and then it was a national monument, but also the, well, the wildlife refuges, that there had to be a finding by the Secretary of Interior that the in, that those interests would not be impacted by water that would be transferred out of the San Luis Valley. The second protection that comes in is, and David Robbins can talk particularly about this, the one created the Great Sand Dunes National Park. You know how the ephem ephemeral river runs through the, through, through the parts of the park. Uh, the hydrologists and the technical people who worked with us on that bill recognize that the sand dunes are there in large part because the water layer essentially is what keeps the sand in place instead of having the sand fly over the mountains and the sand dunes would be gone forever. And so one of the findings that would have to be made by, at some point, maybe by the US Supreme Court, is that whatever export project takes place, it's not gonna have an impact on the sand dunes in violation of that law. And so, our own view, uh, Phil alluded the, to this uh, earlier, is that it, it, this valley is really an incredible valley because of what they've done. Uh, there's no, we talked, I, well, I was director of DNR in 1990. Um, Roy Romer had put me in there. I said, I got brought a bunch of people together for a water summit. Travis was probably there, bro brother Leroy, uh, uh, others were there. I said, why don't we create a basin of origin protection for each of the seven river basins in our state. You know, we're the mothers of, river, of, of, of rivers in Colorado. That's what we're known as, right, Greg? We're the mother of rivers. And so I said, why doesn't each basin basically rely on its own water supply and we avoid all the water exports? Well, that ain't gonna happen, right? Because you're not gonna get Denver to agree with, 
where West Slope will probably agree with us, but where the population lives and the political votes are, that's not going to happen. But what this valley did is on its own, uh, through the lessons of all the water fights, it has protected a system where we are relatively well protected. And I think that, I mean, my own view is I can look 50 years ahead. I think that this valley is going to maintain its sustainability in agriculture because we're going to protect our water through some of these provisions that have been kept in place. Let me give a final note, and I know we're out of time. Ken had that vision. What we have today is there are basins across our state who come together through the Colorado Water Conservation Board to help us advance our Colorado Water Plan. This set of institutions, and we talked to the sub-districts earlier, it is extraordinary. The culture around it is extraordinary, and what we are working hard to do is not allow how we manage water to become a fight between different parts of our state, let alone with other states. That is a very difficult and tall order, but I am optimistic that we're going to meet it. You all being involved, learning about these issues is a part of being citizens. I'm here to work with you, and I look forward to future conversations and efforts. Thank you all very much. Introduce yourselves so people will know you. Right, so I just mentioned the Colorado Water Conservation Board. We're lucky to have such a great director right here. Thank you. I was just trying to sit in the back quietly, but um, uh, the Rio Grande has been um, such a motivator for not only myself, but the other basins across the state, and they've really led on innovation and outreach and education and the forest health and watershed health. So um, we actually come here to listen and not to speak because we have so much to learn from this basin and, and so much um, that, uh, that we can share to the other basins on what they're doing right. So um, thank you, and thank you for allowing us to be here, and um, we'll support you in any way that we possibly can. So, thank you, Becky. I just wanted to, I wanted all of you to, you know, there's some people who are just phenomenal. Amy, why don't you come up too? Amy, Amy. Come on up, Amy. Uh, I'll tell you, when, when, you get a, when you get elected attorney general and you have a few positions to fill, for every one of them you get like a thousand people. And one of the things that Phil did is, uh, as he always does, he picked the very best and the brightest to run the Natural Resources <laughs> Division. Thank you. Um, there, th you guys had a lot of different conversations and a lot of different threads and some of it is very community driven and some of it is very legal. Bring all your best and your brightest to the table. Every person who represents all of the various perspectives on the challenges that you're going to face, make sure you have all of those people coming to the table. Phil mentioned listening, Phil mentioned community, Phil mentioned innovation, he mentioned optimism. Take all of that recipe for success and keep looking at all of the challenges that you're facing and just bang on them. Is this a good idea? And just keep banging. Is this a good idea from a legal perspective, a community perspective? from an agricultural perspective, from an economic perspective. So, um, and I do have some answers to some of the more technical legal questions that were asked, but we're out of time and good God, I don't wanna do that to all of you right now. <laughs> but you should feel free to reach out to us if you do wanna know a little bit more about the legal infrastructure surrounding things like out of base and transfers. And also um, there is a ranking of beneficial uses in the constitution, but it has been interpreted in a particular and very restricted way, so I'm happy to to share some of that with you all, but offline. <laughs> so let me, uh, one last thing, I, I just, uh, so this is uh, sponsored by uh, Adams State University, the Rio Grande Water Conservation District, and also the Salazar Center here at Adams State, which uh, my family and I founded, and want to uh, have my brother, Leroy, where are you, Leroy? Stand up, where are you? There he is, Leroy. My, my nephew, Esteban, Esteban. And my brother Elliot, who's here. And my sister-in-law, Loretta, who was checking everybody in. Stand up, Loretta. If anybody wants to know anything about the Rio Grande South, don't stay standing up. <laughs> stay standing up. <laughs> don't, don't, don't go ask any of the Hispanic settlers from the southern part of the valley. Ask Loretta, because she knows more than anybody. <laughs> 
and, 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 and finally, to this great man who took his hat to the ring and ran to be Attorney General and is a great Attorney General for Colorado, thank you, Phil Weiser.